Hello everyone, welcome to Smart Catalyst, 13 November 2018. First, we are going to see topics for prelims. It is first is IONS 10th anniversary celebrations. Second one is Commerce Minister leads delegation for RCEP meet in Singapore. Third one is Iran in complaints with 2015 nuclear deal IAEA report. Fourth is Central Zoo Authority. Fifth one is Rafael deal not done in a hurry center. Sixth one is Prime Minister Modi to inaugurate multimodal terminal in Varanasi. And we have added some more topics to MCQs. For that, please download it from the link given below. So the first topic of today is IONS 10th Anniversary Celebrations. So the news is 10th Anniversary Commemorative Activities of the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium has taken place. So what is the theme of this Indian Ocean Naval Symposium is IONS as a catalyst for Sagar. So what is Sagar? Sagar is security and growth for all in the region. So Sagar means ocean. So Sagar is a consonance with India's Act East policy and the nation's diplomatic, economic and military outreach in the region. So from this, 26 of the 32 member countries participated in the event. So with respect to Sagar, we will see what is IONS. It is Indian Ocean Naval Symposium. So it is a voluntary initiative that seeks to increase maritime cooperation among navies of littoral states. So the littoral states means the states which is bordering the oceans that is water bodies of the Indian Ocean region by providing an open and inclusive forum for discussion of regionally relevant maritime issues. So here we have given the members of IONS which is South Asian littorals which includes these countries and West Asian littorals, East African littorals, Southeast Asian and Australian littorals. So we India come under South Asian littorals. There are 32 members in which 24 members are permanent members and 8 members are observers. So the next topic is Commerce Minister leads delegation for RCEP meet in Singapore. So this is the second RCEP leader summit which is going to be held in Singapore. So for this we should know what is regional comprehensive economic partnership. So this is a pact which is covering almost all the parts of trades which includes goods, services, investments, economic and technical cooperation competition and intellectual property rights. So why RCEP is important? So discovering 16 countries which includes 10 Asian countries along with six other Asia Pacific countries like India, China, South Korea, Japan, Australia and New Zealand. So it is covering 3.4 billion people which is the total population of these countries and almost 40% of global trade. The total GDP is 17 trillion US dollars. Among RCEP countries, other countries are pushing liberalization of trades in terms of goods. But India, we are pushing towards services trades because 55% of India's GDP is depending upon service sector. There are other regional trade agreements in Asia Pacific region. They are FTAAP, RCEP and TPP. In this TPP, United States recently opted out of it. So before going to this, we will see a small timeline. So US imposed sanctions on Iran that they are developing nuclear weapons. So in 2015, JCPOA was signed. So JCPOA is Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So by this, Iran was asked to allow IAEA check the nuclear facilities to prevent Iran from developing nuclear weapons. In 2018, again the US President accused Iran for developing nuclear weapons and reimposed the sanctions. So the reports from IAEA indicates that Iran is still honoring the 2015 nuclear deal. The following facts substantiate that Iran is still following the deal. Iran has kept its stock of low enriched uranium at 149.4 kg which is very less than the limit given in the deal. So heavy water moderator and nuclear reactors still restricted under the deal and the level to which it refines uranium is also within the limits. So 1.7 tons were shipped abroad while 1.5 tons were used to make only medical components. So before this we should know what is IAEA which is International Atomic Energy Agency which is also called as Atoms for Peace 
It is an international center for cooperation in nuclear field and the main aim is to promote the safe, secure and peaceful use of nuclear technology. It has to report to both United Nations General Assembly and United Nations Security Council. So next we are going to see about what is Central Zoo Authority. So Central Zoo Authority is an autonomous statutory body and it is the regulator for the functions of zoos and it has been constituted under the Wildlife Protection Act of 1972 and it was established under Central Zoo Rules 1992. The organization is constituted with 12 members in which Minister of State of Environment Ministry is the ex officio chairman plus 10 members and a member secretary is also included. What is the main objective of Central Zoo Authority is that to complement the national effort in the conservation of wildlife. So we will see what are all the roles and functions of Central Zoo Authority. So we will see what are all the roles and functions of Central Zoo Authority. It gives financial and technical assistance. It approves grants of recognition and release of financial assistance. And the most important point is, this authority regulates the exchange of animals of endangered category which is included under the Schedule 1 and Schedule 2 of Wildlife Protection Act. And this authority has to approve the exchange of animals between Indian and foreign zoos. And this authority has to take care of capacity building of zoo personnel, planned breeding programs, And the most importantly, excited research including biotechnical interventions for conservation. So the next topic is Rafael deal not done in a hurry center. There was an allegation that the center did not follow the defense procurement procedure of 2013. What does this procedure says? It mandates that acquisition worth rupees 1000 crores should be first cleared by cabinet committee on security. So what is cabinet committee on security? The cabinet committee on security is the final decision making authority on senior appointments in the national security, defense policy and expenditure and all matters of India's national security. So the cabinet committee on security is chaired by prime minister and the other members are minister of home affairs, minister of external affairs, minister of finance and minister of defense. The defense acquisition council is chaired by defense minister. It is having inbuilt checks and balances in relation to the procurements and this is to counter the corruption and speed up the decision making in the military procurements. The next topic is based on places and news. The first is Venezuela. So this country is in the South American continent and this is bordered by the Caribbean Sea and the North Atlantic Ocean. The countries which are bordering this is Colombia, Brazil and Guyana. So why this is recently in news is that there are some internal governmental issues and the economy is also very weak. It withdrew from OPEC in 2015. It is an oil rich country. In prelims perspective it is important to know geography related to current affairs. So we will see what are all the geographical features of Venezuela. In the western part it is having the Andes mountain and Venezuela is also having the tropical grasslands called Llanos and southern part of the country is having the Amazon jungle. Rio Orinoco is the river which is passing through the grassland and the capital of this country is Caracas. So next place in news is Yemen. So Yemen is considered to be one of the poorest countries in the world. So why it is in news? It is because there is a civil war which is taking place in the country between the Houthi tribe and the government which was started in 2015. So these are the port cities of Yemen. In this the red color points are the ports which is under the government control and the black points are under the Houthi tribe. The government supported by the Saudi Arabia is trying to capture the Hodeida port because it is having a strategic importance as it is placed in between the Mandeb Strait and the Suez Canal. So next topic is first ever multimodal terminal in Varanasi. This multimodal terminal in Varanasi has been opened as a part of Jalmark Vikas project. This project is opened in the National Waterway 1 which is from Allahabad to Haldia. Jalmark Vikas project is aiming to develop inland waterways in India which is under the control of Inland Waterway Authority of India. 
So now we will see the importance of Jalmar Vikas project. Jalmar Vikas project was announced in the 2014 budget. So this is very important because it is improving the ease of doing business. and the logistics of India. It is also environment friendly. The expenditure for this multimodal terminal is shared between the central government and the World Bank. So this is expected to generate about 500 direct employment and more than 2000 indirect employment opportunities. So this terminal is between Varanasi and Haldia and the places in between are Kolkata, Faraka, Kahalgon, Bahalpur, Patna. So this is the first multimodal terminal among the three multimodal terminals which are Varanasi, Sahib Ganj and Haldia. In this Varanasi has been opened first. Now we are going to discuss few main topics. First is RBI unlikely to open windows for NBFCs. International Food Policy Research Institute, IFPRI study on anemia. Third one is fixing Poshan Abhiyan's basics. Fourth is financing of disaster risk management by public, private and multilateral institutions. So the first topic is RBI unlikely to open the window for NBFCs. The news is that RBI is unlikely to provide any special support to the demands for liquidity support for NBFCs. RBI's view is that RBI should be the lender of last resort to all the NBFCs. Before that, they should explore other options that may have turned expensive for them. But the issue is that bigger NBFCs that have high ratings will not face any liquidity issues. But these mid-sized and smaller NBFCs, mostly housing finance firms will be facing these liquidity issues. To understand this, we should know the difference between banks and NBFCs. First is that a non-banking finance companies cannot accept the demand deposits. Since NBFCs do not form the part of payment and settlement system, they cannot issue checks drawn on itself. Banks are regulated by RBA, but the NBFCs are regulated by multiple regulators. First, the insurance companies is, are regulated by IRDA, merchant banks are regulated by SEBI, and microfinance institutions are regulated by three players, state government, RBI and NABAD. The norms of public sector lending is not applied to the NBFCs. Cash reserve requirements like CRR and SLR does not apply to NBFCs. Apart from availing liquidity support from RBI, NBFCs can seek liquidity support from APEX banks like SIDB, National Housing Bank and they can also go to refinancing by selling their loans to banks like banks like SBI, NHB. Initially, the refinancing limit of NHB was 6,000 crores. But due to the increasing market demand, the refinancing limit has been increased to 30,000 crores. And even the SBI has trebled its loan purchase target for NBFCs to rupees 45,000 crores. While the government is having a short-term mission, the RBI is having a long-term vision. Disagreement should not create an issue in the Indian economy. So they should come into a conclusion so that both of them are favored. So next topic is International Food Policy Research Institute's study on anemia. So first we should know what is anemia. Anemia is the deficiency of hemoglobin in human beings. Hemoglobin is having two parts, heme plus globin, in which heme is the iron part and globin is the protein part. Why Indian women are anemic? Indian women who are anemic are pushed into a vicious circle which is caused by the poverty malnutrition and along with the education gender bias they are pushed into early marriages and poor spacing between children. This is creating anemic mothers where anemic mothers give birth to anemic infants and children who are very poor in immunity and prone to diseases caused by parasites. The report suggests that the government health nutrition programs are reducing the anemic in children under 5 years of age and expected mothers, but it is failing to focus on girls and non-pregnant women at their adolescent age. So what are all the findings of studies? The National Family Health Survey which is conducted in 2005 to 6 and the latest one in 2015 to 16 are stating that hemoglobin is improved in the period under 5 years of age and pregnant women. But in teenage girls and women, it is 
mere 2.1 percentage reduction which is 55 percentage to 52.9 percentage. There is a high variability between different states in which As Assam is showing the greatest reduction in anemia which is about 69 percentage in 2006 to 36 percentage in 2016 and followed by Chhattisgarh with a 30 percentage point in reduction. Though anemia has declined in most states, it has increased in two states among children which is Delhi and Goa and has increased in expected mothers for three states, Delhi, Himachal Pradesh and Punjab. About in eight states, non-pregnant women are affected to anemia which is including developed states like Tamil Nadu, Punjab and Kerala. So why is the improvement in hemoglobin level of people has been increased is that first is the mother's education is developed which is leading to the improvement in the socio-economic status. Since the socio-economic status of people is increased, they are consuming protein rich food like meat and fish consumption which is developing the hemoglobin level in the human beings. According to the study of IFPRI, there is a flaw in targeting which is only focusing on pregnant women and young children. There should be a holistic approach to develop the hemoglobin level in the blood. According to World Health Organization, anemia is a severe public health problem. If you are not correcting the approach, we might miss the World Health Organization 2025 target of anemia reduction by 50 percentage relative to 2010 levels, especially women in reproductive age. Next topic is fixing Poshan Abhiyan's basics. Poshan stands for Prime Minister's Overarching Scheme for Holistic Nutrition. What is the aim of Poshan is that it aims on holistic development and adequate nutrition for pregnant women, mothers and children. So, since it is concentrating on pregnant women, mothers and children, it is under the Ministry of Ministry of Women and Child Development. So, this portion Abhiyan scheme is implemented through Anganwadi centers which acts as the focal point of delivery of health and nutrition services for pregnant women, lactating mothers and children. Now, these Anganwadi centers are doing good in terms of quantity, quality and coverage of services provided to the beneficiaries. This has reflected positively in maternal and child health indicators. But there are certain flaws in Anganwadi centers. But there are few flaws in Anganwadi centers. They include these Anganwadi centers are lacking basic amenities and they are facing infrastructure problems. Around 24 percentage of them lack their own building and they are renting buildings to run them. So there is a recent Niti Aayog study which is stating that Anganwadi centers are maintaining poor manual records. This can be rectified by including information and communication technologies which is enabling real time monitoring inside them. The most important part of Poshan Abhiyan scheme is the Anganwadi workers who are rendering vital services to mothers and children in villages. There is a plan for construction of 36,000 Anganwadi centers which has to meet the required standards of space, cleanliness, convenience of locality etc. These suggestions can be used to answer the questions posed by the shortcomings. First of all, the district administration should be vested with more powers so that they can fill the vacancy and shortage of staffs by themselves. This will reduce the time consumed to meet the needs. And next is the supply of iron or folic acid tablets should be regulated and the take home ration should be supplied regularly. The recent Poshan Ma Awards will honor the Anganwadi workers who are the major part of Poshan Abhiyan implementation. The recent Prime Minister's video conference with frontline workers and the announcement of an increase in the remuneration will act as an encouragement for the Anganwadi workers to work in an efficient manner. The next topic is financing of disaster risk management by public, private and multilateral institutions. Recently, 15th Finance Commission conducted a workshop on in financial disaster risk management in India. Before that, we should know what is Finance Commission. Finance Commission is a constitutional body which is gaining its powers and functions from Article 280 of Indian Constitution. In this workshop, Finance Commission was formed to define the financial relations between the centre and state. The 15th Finance Commission, which is constituted in 2017, states that there is an increased number of stakeholders in the disaster risk management and there is a change in triology of risk, responsibility and resources. India is a signatory of Sendai framework which has identified investment in resilience. The Sendai framework is having four pillars in which the Finance Commission is talking about the investing in the disaster risk reduction for resilience. Earlier finance commissions were concentrating on disaster management
Now the 15th Finance Commission is concentrating on disaster mitigation. As a result, the 15th Finance Commission has issued the terms of reference which is mandating to review the Disaster Management Act of 2005 and recommend appropriate changes to them. Some of the important points deliberated are the credible data system should be available publicly. Any delays in allotting fund may increase the risk, so the ability to move the money should be speeded up. And one important point, hazard risk index should be measured, which is useful to measure the vulnerability of states, which is including two points. First, it is the hazard profile of the state and the multidimensional poverty index of the state. Thank you.